Let us praise our heavenly King as we turn in our Psalters this evening to Psalm 106. Psalm 106 and verses 1 to 5. Psalm 106 verses 1 to verse number 5. Give praise and thanks unto the Lord. For bountiful is he, his tender mercy doth endure unto eternity. God's mighty works who can express or show forth all his praise. Blessed are they that judgment keep and justly do always. Let us praise our heavenly king, verses one to verse five. Give praise and thanks unto come unto thee this evening, dear Father, in the name of thy Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, in whom thou art well pleased. And we come in the mighty name of our Savior, in his reputation, in his merits, in his finished and sufficient and final work. Father, we come unto thee this evening seeking thy help the end of a Sabbath day, that thou wouldst be glorified in our midst, that we would sing of thy praises, that our hearts and our minds and our affections would be nigh unto thee, that we would exalt thee with all our heart, with all our mind, with all our strength, that we would see and exalt our mighty God, who is King of kings and Lord of lords, 
that we would look upon thy Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and rejoice in him, that he would be the object of our delight, that he would be food and drink for us, that we would be dependent on him and trust not in ourselves. Father, may we look unto thee, our great and mighty King. And as we look unto thee and thy truth and thy wisdom as revealed in Holy Scripture, we see we have fallen short of thy perfect, holy, and righteous standard. Thy Son has kept that law in our place. We thank thee, O Lord, for redemption found only in him, the great King of kings and Lord of lords, the Son of the living God. May we look unto him this morning or this evening, and may we find joy and peace May we find refreshment at the end of the Sabbath day. May we find peace. May we taste and see that the Lord is good, who trusts in him is blessed. We pray that we would see more of Christ here this evening, that we would long for heaven more and more as we learn, learn of him. Heavenly Father, we are but of the dust. We are creatures. We are finite. We depend on thee for all things. For the breath entering into our lungs, for every beat of our heart, for every second we're upon this earth. We depend on thee. And we thank thee, O Lord, for how thou providest for us, how we're able to come here this evening the privileges that we have, the food in our table, all these wonderful things are gifts from thee. We pray that we would, in all that we do, whatsoever we eat or whatsoever we drink, may all be done to the glory of God. May we worship thee here this evening, not out of mere religious, external, mechanical ways, but may we do so from our hearts, out of our heart, heart full of thanksgiving, that loves thee, that is grateful to thee for what thou, thy son has done for us, how thy son has shed his blood, suffered and died in our place, that wonderful gift of God, that gift of infinite value, that precious blood of Christ. We thank thee, O Lord, here this evening. And we pray that thou wouldst be pleased to be in our midst, pardoning and cleansing us, O God, for thy mercy is great. O Lord, do so for thy glory's sake. Forgive us and draw us nigh unto thee. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Please turn with me in your New Testaments to Mark chapter 1. Mark chapter 1. And we're going to read the first few verses from Mark chapter 1. We are reading for the New Testament this evening. And praise to our heavenly King. Mark chapter 1, we're going to read from verses 1 down to verse number 13. Mark chapter 1, the Gospel of Mark, from verses 1 down to verse number 13. Let us hear God's holy and infallible word. The beginning of the Gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as it is written in the prophets, behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. John did baptize in the wilderness, 
and preach the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. And there went out unto him all the land of Judea and they of Jerusalem and were all baptized of him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. And John was clothed with camel's hair and with a girdle of a skin about his loins. And he did eat locusts and wild honey and preached saying, there cometh one mightier than I after me, the latchet of whose shoes I am not worthy to stoop down and unloose. I indeed have baptized you with water, but he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost. It came to pass in those days that Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized of John in Jordan. Straightway coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens open and the spirit like a dove descending upon him. There came a voice from heaven saying, Thou art my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. And immediately the spirit driveth him into the wilderness. And he was there in the wilderness, forty days tempted of Satan, and was with the wild beasts and the angels ministered unto him and may the lord bless the reading of his holy and infallible and inerrant word let us turn out our soldiers to psalm number 77 psalm number 77 in psalm number 77 we're going to sing verses 12 to verse number 15. Verses 12 down to verse number 15. I also will of all thy works my meditation make, and of thy doings to discourse great pleasure I will take. O God, thy way most holy is within thy sanctuary. And what God is so great in power as is our God most high psalm 77 from verses 12 to verse 15. I also
And then please turn with me in your Old Testament to the book of Exodus, Exodus chapter number 5, Exodus chapter 5, for a reading of God's holy word. Exodus chapter 5. And afterward Moses and Aaron went in and told Pharaoh, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Let my people go, that they may hold a fast, a feast, unto me in the wilderness. And Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord that I should obey his voice to let Israel go? I know not the Lord. Neither will I let Israel go. And they said, The God of the Hebrews hath met with us. Let us go, and we pray thee, three days journey into the desert and sacrifice unto the Lord our God, lest he fall upon us with pestilence or with the sword. And the king of Egypt said unto them, Wherefore do ye, Moses and Aaron, that the people for their works get you unto your burdens. And Pharaoh said, Behold, the people of the land now are many, and ye make them rest from their burdens. And Pharaoh commanded the same day the taskmasters of the people and their officers, saying, Ye shall no more give the people straw to make brick, as heretofore. Let them go and gather straw for themselves. And the tale of the bricks which they did make heretofore, ye shall lay upon them, ye shall not diminish aught thereof, for they be idle. Therefore they cry, saying, Let us go and sacrifice to our God. Let their more work be laid upon the men, that they may labor therein, and let them not regard vain works. And the taskmasters of the people went out and their officers, and they spake to the people, saying, Thus saith Pharaoh, I will not give you straw. Go ye, get the straw where ye can find it, yet not aught of your work shall be diminished. So the people were scattered abroad through all the land of Egypt to gather stubble instead of straw. And the taskmasters hasted them, saying, Fulfill your works, your daily tasks, as when there was straw. And the officers of the children of Israel, which Pharaoh's taskmasters had set over them, were beaten and demanded. Wherefore, have ye not fulfilled your task in making brick both yesterday and today as heretofore? Then the officers of the children of Israel came and cried unto Pharaoh, saying, Wherefore dealest thou thus with thy servants? There is no straw given unto thy servants, and they say to us, Make brick, and behold, thy servants are beaten, but the fault is in thine own people. But he said, Ye are idle, ye are idle. Therefore ye say, Let us go and do sacrifice to the Lord. Go therefore now and work, for there shall no straw be given you, yet shall ye deliver the tale of bricks. And the officers of the children of Israel did see that they were in evil e case. After it was said, ye shall not minish aught from your bricks of your daily task. And they met Moses and Aaron, who stood in the way, as they came forth from Pharaoh, and they said unto them, The Lord look unto you, and judge, because ye have made our Savior, our Savior, to be abhorred in the eyes of Pharaoh, and in the eyes of his servants, to put a sword in their hand to slay us. And Moses returned unto the Lord and said, Lord, wherefore hast thou so evil entreated this people? Why is it that thou hast sent me? For since I came to Pharaoh to speak in thy name, he hath done evil to this people, neither hast thou delivered thy people at all. 
And may the Lord bless the reading of his holy and his infallible word. And now turn once again in our Psalter, Psalm 106. Psalm 106. Psalm 106, verses 43 to verse number 48. Psalm 106, verses 43 to verse 48. He many times delivered them, but with their counsel so, they am provoked that for their sin they were brought very low, yet their affliction he beheld when he did hear their cry, and he for them his covenant did call to memory. And then at the end in verse 48, blessed be Jehovah Israel's God to all eternity. Let all the people say, Amen. Praise to the Lord. Give ye. Let us sing to God's praise, verses 43 to the end of the psalm. Ye many times great and glorious King. Lord, we come unto thee this evening to hear thy truth as thy people, saved by the grace of God. 
We thank thee for thy graciousness and thy mercy. And we pray that thou wouldst be merciful to us this evening in teaching us thy ways. Strengthen us, O God. Bring courage to our faint hearts. Take away fear of men and replace it, O Lord, with the fear of Almighty God. Lord, we pray that thou wouldst remove foolishness from our hearts and replace it with wisdom from on high. Help us, dear Father, to hear thee this evening. Though we may be tired, though we may be weary, may the Spirit of Almighty God focus our hearts and our minds in the eye of faith, O Lord, upon thy Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, that we would learn of thee, we would learn of thy law, and meditate upon it day and night, that we would receive these truths this evening, not as the word of men, but as the word of the living God. May we apply these truths to our hearts. May they not just be things for our minds, but may they be for our head, our heart, and our hands. That it would change us from the inside out. That it would glorify thy Son. That the truth may go forth with mighty power. That the truth may be seen in our lives and how we live, in our homes, in our families, in our communities, in our places of work. Bring strength, O Lord, to us where we feel weak. Harden us when we fall short. Give us encouragement here this evening in a world that is ever more hostile to the gospel in many parts of the world. Bring light to places of darkness. But strengthen us that we may never lose hope. That thou art good and all powerful. That thou doest all things for thy glory's sake. May we look unto thee here this evening with confidence in thy Son and the deliverance that he has purchased. May we look unto the, the new Jerusalem, that celestial city. Though we are in the wilderness at this moment, though we face trial, and difficulty thou will bring us home one day by thy mighty power bless us and keep us for thy great and mighty name's sake pardoning our many sins in jesus name amen please turn with me in your bibles once again to exodus chapter 5 exodus chapter number five in exodus exodus chapter number five our title for this evening's message is god's people in a hostile world god's people in a hostile world we live in challenging times times that many of us would not have imagined 20 years ago, 30 years ago, 40 years ago. Challenges that many of us never faced decades ago. In many places in the Western world, either here in Scotland or where I currently live in Northern Ireland, there are fewer and fewer people who attend church. And this is something that ha is happening right across the Western world. One missionary told a group of us one time that apparently for every one person coming to know the Lord in the Western world, there are 16 coming to know the Lord in the developing world. Why that is happening, the Lord knows. But it presents challenges, does it not? We see fewer Christians teaching in schools. 
different emphasis in the school system. And things that we're facing today would horrify our parents or our grandparents' generation if they knew that it would come to this point. A rapid decline and a departure from Almighty God. But it's not the first time it's ever happened. This is one thing we should find courage with as we look at this text. It's not the first time God's people have lived in a changing an ever more challenging world. God's people in our text were in Egypt for hundreds of years and they faced relatively comfortable time under Joseph. And while people remembered Joseph, there was some favor toward the people of God in Egypt. They lived fairly comfortably. However, that was all about to change. And it begins to change at the beginning of the book of Exodus. A new Pharaoh comes along who does not remember Joseph. Does that not remind you of today? There was a time when people would have been very fondly thinking of many Christian leaders in these islands but today things have changed once perhaps we lived a somewhat comfortable existence of course life is never easy but that has come to change God's people were delivered hundreds of years prior to this from famine because of the Lord using Joseph in that time But life gets much harder. Egypt becomes a much more hostile place for God's people. How about today? We don't know how much longer this current pattern in society, whether that's in Scotland, whether that's in Northern Ireland, perhaps in England, the Republic of Ireland, wherever we look, there's a certain direction. But the Lord is still in control. Societies that once had some favor towards Christians, that is fading. It's getting harder and harder to keep the Sabbath day. Harder and harder for Christians to be elected to public office, to own a business, to be a teacher. In Exodus chapter 5, we arrive at a challenging time. A time far more openly hostile to God's people than before. So as we look at Exodus chapter 5, may we find encouragement as we're not the first generation to face such challenge of believers being in a hostile world. Our first point as we look at this chapter is number one, direction for the Lord's people. Direction for the Lord's people. No matter what is happening, no matter how difficult things get, the instructions are the same. Thus saith the Lord. We must never make circumstances a reason to set aside the word of the living God. In our text here in Exodus chapter 5, The word of the living God is delivered, not just to Israel, it's delivered to a pagan Pharaoh. Says in verse 1, And afterward Moses and Aaron went in and told Pharaoh, Thus saith the Lord, God of Israel, Let my people go, that they may hold a feast unto me in the wilderness. And also verse 3, And they said, The God of the Hebrews hath met met with us. Let us go, we pray thee, three days journey into the desert and sacrifice unto the Lord our God, lest he fall upon us with pestilence and with the sword. The Lord, even in such times, 
does not leave us to make it up as we go along. It's the same, thus saith the Lord. We have, thus saith the Lord, in the Holy Scriptures. Genesis to Revelation. And the commandment of Almighty God. What we are as God's people to do is revealed to us in Scripture. Even though we face opposition, and they did in that time, the word of the living God was delivered to a powerful king, Pharaoh. Could you imagine that today? Going before the prime minister in Westminster and saying to them, God says what your responsibility is. It's what, our, it's what this nation did in, the, in times past. They warned various kings of the responsibility before Almighty God. Yes, he is the God of Israel, but he's also the God over Pharaoh, whom Pharaoh is to bow before. And it's as just as the responsibility is for Pharaoh to obey God before this, and it is for God's people. It is afterward. What do they seek? What do the, the people of God seek to do? It says, let my people go. They seek freedom. Freedom to do what? That they may hold a feast unto me in the wilderness. Verse 3, and they said, the God of, of the Hebrews hath met with us. Let us go. We pray thee three days into the desert and sacrifice unto the Lord our God. They are seeking this freedom from Egypt to go and to worship God. To worship God publicly. They're in need of God's blessings. They see this at the end of verse 3. And sacrifice unto the Lord our God, lest he fall upon us with pestilence and with the sword. They knew. The two paths are laid before them. The keeping of the covenant of grace by faith alone in Jesus Christ alone. Yes, Moses and others, they look forward to, the, to Christ who was to come. But they were to follow God. And they knew if they didn't follow God, destruction lay before them also. We need the same thing today, the direction of the Lord. It is a narrow way that leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. And the broad way, the way that all the world takes, and they all go various different ways, but it's a broad way that leadeth unto destruction, and many there be there go thereat. The way of the Lord is to worship and gather as one people, to seek that freedom from the world, but more than that. Seeking freedom from bondage, from a cruel taskmaster, to go and worship God, that they may dwell in the presence of Almighty God. Such direction and purpose from our lives, it comes from God's word. It doesn't come from human wisdom. Human wisdom would tell you, why would you dare challenge the Pharaoh? Don't you know it's going to make things worse? And they see later on, it actually does. But God's ways are higher than our ways. We need God's direction in whatever we're doing. How are we to know what to do? In our Christianity, in our approach before Almighty God, we must not seek to make it up as we go along. How do we know to follow God? How do we know to have freedom in Jesus Christ? How do we know to exit out of spiritual Egypt? The house of bondage and slavery and a cruel taskmaster. How do we exit out of that place? It's only as revealed in the word of God. Looking unto the Savior. Looking unto the Passover lamb. Looking unto the one who was slain. We must always have the idea. And it seems like such a simple idea. 
And it's an idea that many people, very smart people, will, will scoff at. And it's the idea of this. The Bible says it. The Word of God declares this. So we must be resolved to following it. That that's enough for us. The Word of God. Our obedience in following the Lord. What does it show? Our obedience will never save us. It's never good enough. But it shows what's in our heart. It shows it's the fruit or the evidence of the life that is taking place in our hearts. And there's one place in the New Testament that shows an example of this. Matthew chapter 8. Matthew chapter 8 and verses 5 to verse 10. Matthew chapter 8 and verses 5 to and to verse 10. And when Jesus was entered into Capernaum, there came unto him a centurion, beseeching him, and saying, Lord, my servant lieth at home sick of the palsy, grievously tormented. And Jesus saith unto him, I will come and heal him. The centurion answered and said, Lord, I am not worthy that thou shouldst come under my roof. But speak, speak the word only, and my servant shall be healed. For I am a man under authority, having soldiers under me. And I say to this man, Go, and he goeth. And to another, Come, and he cometh. And to my servant, Do this, and he doeth. And when Jesus heard it, he marveled and said unto them that followed, Verily I say unto you, I have not found so great faith, not no, not in Israel. What was so special about the centurion's faith? He knows he's not worthy of the Lord. And he knows the power of the word of God. And he also realizes when he is told, he's a soldier. And when he is told, he goes. And Jesus says, I have not seen such great faith. This was great faith. Realizing how unworthy we are before God. Realizing the power of his word. And realizing we ought to follow him. Without question. That is great faith in the scriptures. Obedience to God's direction. No matter how difficult it may be. And it is hard at times, no matter the obstacle in a way, powerful or not. So we've looked at number one, direction for God's people. Number two now, defiance for God's people. Defiance for God's people. Verse number two in Exodus chapter five. And Pharaoh said, who is the Lord that I should obey his voice to let Israel go? I know not the Lord, neither will I let Israel go. I wonder if you've ever shared the gospel with someone. And the person you share the gospel with, an unbeliever, mocks at the truth, scoffs at it, perhaps even responds in a very similar manner to the way Pharaoh did here. Who is the Lord that I should obey him? They scoff and they think, why should I listen to you? If you've experienced such a thing, it shows that you're faithful in sharing the gospel and praise God for that. But this can be discouraging and disheartening, can't it? To see the response of the unbeliever. When we see the pride and arrogance of a human heart. Pharaoh, as powerful as he is. He is but dust before God. A mere creature before God. But yet, he forgets who he is. And he is very, very foolish. Who is the Lord that I should obey his voice? Notice how there's no indication oh I don't even know if he exists 
Pharaoh knows that this God exists. The problem is not about the lack of evidence. The problem is their attitude toward the true and living God. Defiance against the gospel itself. Who is he that I should obey him? And this is the problem many people will have with the gospel. If you present heaven and hell before people, how many people would say, I would prefer hell? Very few. But they wish not to follow God. They don't wish to follow God. And because they have hostility against the gospel, they will also have hostility against the people of Almighty God. You see, the hostility is seen here toward Moses and toward Aaron. If we turn briefly to John chapter 15. John chapter 15, verses 18 and 19. John chapter 15. If the world hate you, ye know that it hated me before it hated you. If ye were of the world, the world would love his own. But because you are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. Yet the difficulties we will face in the world are not primarily about you or me. They're about a hostility toward God and the message of the gospel. It is here in verse 2 of our text that we see Pharaoh's opposition begins with God. It begins with God. His rejection of his, who is the Lord that I should obey his voice. This is the central problem of the unbeliever. The voice of the Lord is not pleasant to the unbeliever. It's not a lack of evidence. We are surrounded by evidence. The heavens declare the glory of God. And the firmament showeth forth his handiwork. It is all around us. We would never think if we came into this building and we thought, well, that chair was always there. Nobody ever made it. We would never think that no one had made that chair or the building. Why would we think so foolishly about the sun, the moon, and the stars? All of these things, subject to change, began to exist and had a maker a creator and a sustainer, an all-powerful maker, creator, and sustainer. It's not the lack of evidence that the unbeliever struggles with. It's about the voice of God, a defiance against the voice of God, against the Christian message. Now, what happens with that defiance? It, it starts against the gospel message. It's a hostility toward God, but it then spills over to a hostility towards God's people. Look at what happens. There is verse 4, And the king of Egypt said unto them, Wherefore do ye, Moses and Aaron, let the people from their works get you unto your burdens? Pharaoh is not happy that they're seeking this. In verses 7 and 8, You shall no more give the people straw to make brick, as heretofore. Let them go and gather straw for themselves. Sin and the devil is a cruel taskmaster. How dare you seek to seek freedom? How dare you? Verse 8, And the tale of the bricks, or the number of the bricks which they did make heretofore ye shall lay upon them ye shall not diminish aught thereof so the number of bricks that you're supposed to make you must keep up with that but no straw for making these bricks and look at the accusation that comes out of this hostility toward the message 
they, he shall not diminish aught thereof, for they be idle. Therefore they cry, saying, let us go and sacrifice to our God. See, the real problem is, you're lazy. You're idle. You don't want to go worship God. You just want a day off. That's what, maybe the accusation from the world. Who is the one who accuses the brethren? There is a one known as the accuser who accused Job in Job chapter 1, the devil. In Revelation chapter 12 and verse 10, the devil is known as the accuser of the brethren and he hurls these accusations before the throne of God. He hurls these accusations before the people of God. And you see, Pharaoh is merely an instrument of the devil. Twisting the motivation of the people of God. And the devil does not want anyone to break away. And Pharaoh said, verse 5, Behold, the people of the land now are many, as you make them rest from the burdens. There is worry and concern going into his mind. But if we're facing such hostility, and maybe you're in your work, it may be in your family. It may be in your community. Remember the blessings that Jesus spoke of in the Beatitudes. Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5 and verses 10 to 12. It says this. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. And then Jesus says something that might sound very strange to many of our ears. Rejoice. That sounds strange to many of our ears. But we're to rejoice in the midst of these things. Why? And be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. If you are reviled and acute, it's not pleasant. It is not pleasant. But Jesus reminds them. He's speaking before a crowd of people, seeking to be healed, seeking all the things that the world typically looks after. But he tells them what it means to be truly blessed. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets which were before you. Rejoice. Rejoice. Our third point is distress for God's people. So we've looked at direction for God's people, defiance for God's people. Number three now, distress for God's people. We don't want to lighten this because it's not easy. It's challenging. It's upsetting. Verse 9 says this, Let their more work be laid upon the men, that they may labor therein, and let them not regard vain words. What happens? And we see here, even in the midst of which they're doing the right thing, Moses and Aaron, let my people go that they may go and worship me. Things initially, for a time, get harder, get more challenging, get more distressing, get more upsetting, you could say. And verses 13 and 14 says this, And the taskmasters hasted them, saying, Fulfill your works, your daily tasks, when they were, were a straw. And the officers of the children of Israel, which Pharaoh's taskmasters had said over them, were beaten and demanded. Wherefore have ye not fulfilled your task in making brick both yesterday and today as heretofore? They are so struggling to find straw that they're get, gathering up stubble and they can't make the brick. And they're being beaten and horribly treated because they can't fulfill the quota 
a number of bricks that they had done before. It's cruel and it's unreasonable. And it's distressing. It's hard. We must also point out, sometimes we can look back in church history and we can think of Polycarp and these other martyrs of the faith. We can look back to the 16th century and 17th century, people who died were burned at the stake. They suffered greatly because they loved Jesus above all else. There is a distress also for the person who would flee sin. I think there's also a picture here of this. For the person who would even dare venture out to see that freedom. The devil doesn't want to let the unbeliever go. And he will apply more and more burdens upon that person who will even, they're not yet converted, but they're looking into it. Not yet come to a love of Christ. They have not yet been delivered. But they have a sense of their guilt. And it becomes more and more tormenting. I think it was largely what happened to a number of Christians in the past, men such as Martin Luther, until he finally saw the freedom spoken about in Romans chapter 1, verse 17. The just shall live by faith. They may see some of the joy of freedom, but the devil does not want to let them go. They don't want them to look over to those places of those who would have escaped. Rescued by God's power. Brethren, we need to pray, don't we? There are people whose consciences are being awakened by the truth. And while it is not in our power, it's in God's power, but we ought to pray that those people we share the gospel with would be set free from this bondage of sin. In repenting of sin as well, a believer may face an onslaught of temptation and trial. We face, we, ch we are challenged with the world, the flesh, and the devil. The devil, here using Pharaoh, wants God's people to continue to be slaves. The devil today continues to want you to be a slave. God which is freedom, the freedom to follow him, the freedom to worship him, the freedom to enjoy him and not find pleasure in him. I guess what we're pointing out here is in the midst of these trials, in the midst of following God, it's not as I heard once years ago, a children's song which says, happy all the time. I remember something didn't sit well with me when I heard that song years ago. As, as Christians, we have a joy and a peace that passes all understanding, but our experience in this world is not happy all the time. Yes, we have wonderful heavenly peace, but we also have earthly distress, so much so that we don't love this present evil age. We long, we groan, we suffer, looking forward to the world to come. You see, and if you've read Pilgrim's Progress, we are on a journey going through that wilderness, seeking that celestial city that is above, that city where there is freedom. But on our journey to that celestial city, there will be distresses, there will be challenges. But they make us, don't they? Long for a land of milk and honey. To long in a land of plenty and abundance. It says in verses 17 down to verse 19. But he said, you're idle. You're idle. Therefore you say, let us go and do sacrifice to the Lord. The world does not understand, does it? There's accusations. There's changing of them. There's manipulating of the motivation 
of God's people. Go therefore now and work, for there shall no straw be given you, yet shall ye deliver the tale or the number of bricks. Finally, number four, deliverance for God's people. Deliverance for God's people. So we've looked at the direction for God's people, and that is the word of God. Defiance for God's people in this world and through the instruments that the devil is using. There's also distress. We must point that out. The experience of the Christian in this world is distressing. And we see it here. But there's also deliverance. Deliverance for God's people. Now this deliverance did not come immediately. And this can be hard for God's people. When it doesn't come immediately, we wonder why not. We share the gospel one time and it's rejected. We think we want to give up. But we've never been promised an easy, immediate victory in all these things. We can become shocked and discouraged and dismayed. Look at the response here in verse 20 and 21. And, and they met Moses and stood in the way as they come forth from Pharaoh. And he said unto them, The Lord look upon you and judge, because you have made our savor, that's our, basically our taste, to be abhorred in the eyes of Pharaoh, and in the eyes of his servants, to put a sword in their hand to slay us. To put it another way, look at what you've done. You've made things worse. Look at what you're doing. They may have expected the fullness of the victory straight away. In, in chapter 4, they see the miracles. They see various signs and wonders that Moses has been sent by God. Oh, wonderful. Oh, go Moses. Oh, we weren't expecting these difficulties. What's happening? But we have to remember, the Lord did not promise us immediate deliverance. We want the fullness of the victory now, don't we? We can often lack patience for the full redemption that is to come and the world to come. Even Moses himself is very timid. He says this in verses 22 and 23, and Moses retreated, returned unto the Lord and said, Lord, wherefore hast thou so evil entreated this people? Why is it that thou hast sent me? For since I came to Pharaoh, to speak in thy name, he hath done evil to this people. Neither hast thou delivered thy people at all. He's astonished. Moses is astonished. Did Moses expect this? You know, Moses has a very timid personality. He was very reluctant to go before Pharaoh at all. He doesn't want to go. And then when he does go, this happens. And he doesn't know what to say. God has promised his victory. That victory is sure to come. That victory did come for the people of God, but not yet. Not in its fullness. It came, we see it later in Exodus 15. Exodus 15, verses 1 to 3. And when they had been delivered from Pharaoh, when they had been delivered from the army that chased them, Exodus 15, verses 1 to 3. Then sang Moses and the children of Israel this song unto the Lord and spake, saying, I will sing unto the Lord, for he hath triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider hath he thrown into the sea. The Lord is my strength and my song, and he is become my salvation. He sees this now. But at this time, he's going through Difficulty in seeing this. What about you? Our sufferings and the disappointments of things that may look as defeats on the surface, causing you to doubt the goodness of God. We must remember what the Lord has promised us. The Lord has promised us deliverance, but He never promised us an easy life. He promised us we would suffer. You see, we can hear the good things and reject 
the not so nice sounding things of the Christian life. There will be full victory. They had that deliverance later on. They come through the Red Sea. They're delivered. The enemies are defeated in the midst of the Red Sea. But that didn't come yet. But it came in God's timing. Deliverance would come. Remember, dear friends, our God is faithful. We may be discouraged in this day and age of small numbers. We may be discouraged from all these things that challenge us. But remember, the full victory is ahead. We must not follow our feelings in such things. We must trust in the promises of Almighty God, seeking His strength, seeking His power from on high. Moses and Aaron lived in a hostile world. Do we? Yes, we do. Today in 2023, but we're not the first. And most likely we will not be the last to face such challenges. But we have a great, powerful, glorious God who delivered his people from Egypt, brought them safely through the Red Sea, brought defeat for the enemies of God in the midst of that Red Sea, brought them from the wilderness through those difficult 40 years, brought them to Canaan does all that he promises he will do and all those with faith the likes of Caleb the likes of Joshua son of Nun they entered into the land of promise by faith it is difficult at times but we must look to the Savior. We must look to his coming, full, and final victory and look forward to that. How many times in the past has God demonstrated his victory? The final, vic the final victory will be over death itself. Won't that be wonderful? Imagine that. A world without death. That's the final enemy to be defeated. And we long for that final victory in the world to come. Amen. Let us stand to pray before Almighty God. Glorious and heavenly Father, powerful, almighty, full of grace and compassion, full of truth, glorious in radiance, we look unto thee as believers living in a hostile world. May we take comfort. May we take courage from thee. May we not be discouraged. May we not be afraid. May we find that courage, that strength from the Holy Spirit. That we would follow thee wherever thou wouldst have us to go. For the glory of Christ. For in him and to him and through him be all things. May we glorify thy son. May we magnify his name. May we find joy in following him. Pardon us for our many sins. Bring refreshment to our weary souls the Sabbath day. And may thy face shine upon us. In Jesus' name. Amen. Let us praise our God as we turn now to Psalm 90 verses 1 to 4. Psalm 90 verses 1 to 4. Psalm 90 verses 1 to 4. This is 
a psalm of Moses, a prayer of Moses, the man of God. Verse 1, Lord, thou hast been our dwelling place in generations all, before thou ever hast brought forth the mountains great or small, ere ever thou hast formed the earth and all the world abroad, even thou from everlasting art to everlasting God. Let us praise our heavenly King, verses 1 to verse 4. Lord, the Some intimations, Lord willing.